Thank you. Uh, let me welcome you once again to this uh, press conference. As we move closer to 1st June, which is the end of the circuit breaker period, we continue to see the number of cases in the community remaining low. These numbers have fallen significantly over the last month, from over 30 cases in mid-April to just a handful over the past week. The situation in the migrant workers' uh, dormitories has also stabilised and under control. However, I must always stress that we must remain vigilant. We understand many of the restrictions during the circuit breaker period have been inconvenient and at times difficult and disruptive. I thank everyone for taking the ch changes in your strike and participating in our circuit breaker and allowing us to keep the number of cases low. We have been progressively easing some of the restrictions since uh, the 5th of May, taking a cautious step-by-step -step approach as we continue to closely monitor the number of new cases in the community. With the end of the circuit breaker, the multi-ministry task force will gradually allow more activities to resume in a safe and controlled manner from 2nd June onwards. This will be done in phases to reduce the risk of a second wave of cases of infections as many countries have experienced after they have lifted their control measures. As we begin to resume more activities, we do expect us to see a rise in daily new cases. The key is to detect these cases and contain them quickly so as to prevent a sharp rise in the number of cases or the emergence of a large cluster. If we can continue to keep the situation under control, we can then continue to reopen progressively and to move on to phase two. In phase one of our reopening, we will gradually allow more people to return to work as we resume more critical and low-risk economic activities. Schools will also be gradually reopened. From 2nd of June, we will also resume some healthcare services with appropriate safe distancing and precautionary measures. These include specialist outpatient services, medical and dental procedures, uh, allied health services, community-based services, and chronic disease management services. Preventive health services such as flu vaccination will recommence. Complementary health care services will resume for one-to-one -one sessions and traditional Chinese medicine needle acupuncture will be allowed for all conditions. The Ministry of Health will separately inform service providers through our usual channels. Our seniors are a particularly vulnerable group and we must continue to take precautions to protect them. Essential senior care services such as residential care and home care services will continue. Senior activity centres will now gradually resume some activities to ensure the psychological well-being of our seniors, especially those with little or no support. All other senior-centric activities such as group exercises or karaoke will continue to be suspended. Many seniors have used the internet to keep in touch with our children and grandchildren during this period. But we understand that many seniors miss seeing their family members throughout this period. We have considered this uh, very carefully and have decided that on balance, we can allow some flexibility. From 2nd of June, each household will be allowed to visit their parent or grandparent staying elsewhere. That means grandparents or parents that are not staying with them but with some restrictions, such as the number of such visits. Seniors, however, should not go out visiting their children. This is to protect the seniors, to encourage them to continue to stay at home so the children or grandchildren can visit their parents or grandparents. But grandparents and parents, please stay at home. Don't go visiting your children because we do want to keep you safe at home. My fellow ministers will provide more details on the other activities that we will resume during this first phase of our reopening. Even as we enter phase one of our reopening, the risk of a resurgence in community transmission remains high, and everyone should play our part and continue to take maximum precautions. 
We should continue to leave home only for essential services and wear a mask when you are out. Seniors should continue to stay at home, as I mentioned, as much as possible. If community transmission rates can remain low and the situation remains under control over the next few weeks, we can then move into phase two of safe transition with a gradual resumption of more activities, both economic and social activities, and gradually transition to phase three, which is a new normal to provide a safe nation. The multi-ministry task force will keep a very close watch on the situation. I want to caution that we may have to tighten some measures in a targeted way or slow down our transition to the next phase should there be a significant resurgence of cases. But if everyone, including employers and individuals, maintain a high level of vigilance, is socially responsible and adheres to the measures that we introduce, we can progress with caution to resume some degree of normalcy. Let us continue to play our part to keep everyone safe, and I'm confident that we will eventually arrive at phase three, a safe nation, a safe Singapore. Let me now say a few words in Mandarin. 大家都期盼着六月一日的到来，也就是阻断期间的阻阻断期的结束。在过去的几个月，我们的呃冠状病毒的病例显著的降低了，从四月中的超过三十起，减少到过去几个星期每天的几起。科工宿舍的情况也稳定了下来，逐渐受到控制。但是我们还是必须时刻保持警惕。我们
。所以，我们每一个人还是继续，还是必须继续尽我们的本分，采取最大限度的预防措施，保护自己，保护家人，保护大家。谢谢大家。Next, I would like to invite、um, Minister for Trade Industry, Mr. Chan Chun Sing, to elaborate on the plans、uh, for opening the economy. Good afternoon, everyone.、Uh, let me cover a few areas today.、Uh, let's start from where we are. What are our considerations for the safe resumption of、uh, economic activities? What are the measures that <coughs> companies and workers must adopt? The sectors which will open or resume after the second of June, and also what are our considerations for the next phase? <coughs> Uh, let me start with where we are now. Today, the majority of workers who can work from home are doing so, and today we have about 17% of our workers working on site to provide the range of essential services for our society. So, during this period, all our domestic essential services continue to operate. We continue. To fulfil our responsibility to the global supply chains, for example, key players in the precision manufacturing, biomedical, petrochemical sectors, and accompanying supply chains have all been <coughs> able to function during this period. We have also maintained all our air, land, and sea links for the world, and also to allow essential supplies to flow through us. So that's where we are today. From the second of June, we have three considerations for the progressive resumption of economic activities. First, we want to make sure that the health and well-being of our workers are taken care of. Second, we will progressively first resume those activities that have a lower risk setting in a controlled environment. For example,、uh, those that have limited or no interactions. With the public, and those sectors that are in a static control environment, that can put in the necessary safe management measures, which I will elaborate soon. The third consideration is that those sectors will be the critical sectors with significant economic linkages, both domestically and externally, and this will allow us to continue to trade with the rest of the world to secure our essential supplies. So these are the three considerations. The health and well-being of our workers, the risk setting of the workplace, and the criticality of the sectors to maintain our production capacities and linkages with the world. So, from the second of June, we will continue the maximum work from home arrangements. So, those who are already working from home should continue to work from home. Only personnel who require the use of machinery. And specialized terminals will be able to return to their factories or workplace, and people who need to complete the legal documentation will also be able to return to their workplace to do that. Workers who need infrequent access to the workplace to obtain in,、uh, information or materials can do so on a time-based exemptions. The time-based exemptions are already in existence today. Now, let me touch on what the companies and workers must do, and the preparation starts from today until the second of June, where we resume. So, there are five things which we would like to have our companies do in preparation for the resumption of economic activities in phase one. First, is to put in place a safe work environment. This include Putting in place safe distancing measures at work and at rest areas. It includes the proper supervision of activities to minimise the need for physical meetings and interactions. The proper use of a contact tracing system. Examples would be a safe entry and trace together. And you will of course need to meet the requisite cleanliness and hygiene standards. So that is the first category of what we call a safe work environment. Second. We'll need the companies and the workers to put in place the safe transport arrangements. We would strongly encourage companies to stagger their work hours.
For example, those in office settings that are not linked to uh, international trade may wish to consider starting their work after 10 a.m. to help us minimize the congestion load during the peak hours in the morning. Third, we would like all companies to consider the safe cohort arrangements to avoid the cross-deployment of staff between different teams both in and outside work. Fourth, we will need the companies to take responsibilities and an active interest on the safe accommodation for their workers. So this will ensure that beyond work, the, wealth, the health and well-being of the workers are well taken care of. Last but not least, on the, the fifth, is for all companies to encourage their workers to be disciplined and not socialise or congregate uh, beyond the workplace. We really need the companies and the workers to work together and take joint responsibility for this because, as uh, Minister Gan said, we want a progressive resumption of work. We would not want a situation whereby we start and stop uh, moving back and forth between the different uh, settings. If there is an outbreak in a particular company, we will have no choice but to shut down either that operations or that part of the operations. So it is in our collective interest, it is in the interest of business continuity for us to take all the five measures that I mentioned, the safe work arrangement, safe transport arrangement, safe cohorting, safe accommodation and also safe social interactions. So we will work with the respective companies and the trade associations to put in place the safe working measures. For the respective sectors which had unique working arrangements, the respective trade associations can also advise their companies to take on the additional measures as necessary for the respective sectors. So from 2nd of June onwards, we expect about a third of our workers to be able to resume work on site and then the rest of the workers will continue to work from home. This will allow uh, more than three quarters of our economy to resume their normal operations. So from the 2nd of June, we will issue class exemptions for businesses that are allowed to open. There's no additional approvals required. And I'll give some examples of the sectors that will resume operations from the 2nd of June. This includes manufacturing and production, finance and insurance, wholesale trade, excluding those with retail shop fronts, transport and storage, professional services. We will also allow some selected services to open, for example, motor vehicle servicing and aircon servicing. Now, for a more thorough breakdown of the sectors that can resume operations, companies can refer to the covid.gobusiness.gov.sg website. Companies will be required to submit their manpower details within two weeks of resuming operations. So they will need to submit the number of workers who need to be on site. The information and website for the submission will be made known next week. I'd just like to say that we urge all companies to practice uh, good management practices so that they minimise the number of workers required on site to the smallest number possible. And we will benchmark the various companies across the same industries and sector. If the manpower numbers are excessive, we will reach out to the company to understand their requirements and to review how we can better support the company and adopt a higher telecommuting workforce. Now let me touch a bit on the next phase. Businesses who are not included in Phase 1 resumption on 2nd of June should also actively prepare for subsequent resumption. There are two subcategories. Some will need to put in place additional measures in order for us to resume business operations. For example, those in the retail sector with a high uh, B to C touch points or FMB will need to start thinking about the new measures that we can put in to have a safe resumption of activities. Uh, to this end, there's already a task force uh, working on this uh, with uh, SMS Cheong Tat guiding them. 
Uh, so the SRA, Singapore Retailer Association, the Restaurant Association of Singapore, they are in this task force actively looking at measures that can, additional measures that can be put in place to allow the safe resumption of those activities. Then the second subcategory will be those that will require a new business model because they are pre-COVID activities are unlikely to resume uh, as per normal. So these include those in the social entertainment sector. But we have been very encouraged that over the last uh, one, two months, we have seen a lot of new initiatives whereby uh, many companies and businesses adopted the digital technologies to not only retain their businesses, but also to expand their market shares. And between MCI and MTI, we will strengthen the efforts to help our companies to digitalize their business processes so that they can emerge stronger from this. So, as uh, Minister Gunn has mentioned, our ability to resume operations for the rest in the subsequent phase will depend first on the overall infection control and second, the ability of our businesses to develop the new necessary support measures sooner. MTI will work with the respective trade associations and chambers to put those in plan, do, to put in plan, uh, place those plans in the meantime. Um, we will also have the relevant support measures to support those companies that are unable to resume their operations on the 2nd of uh, June. Uh, let me conclude by saying that I'd like to thank all the businesses for their understanding. It has been uh, trying and challenging times over the last few weeks. Uh, many of the businesses have their operations disrupted. Many of them have put in place new measures in order to sustain their businesses and keep their workers. And there will be more challenges along the way. But we want to assure the business community that we'll continue to walk this journey with them, uh, not just to put in place measures to tie over the short-term difficulties, but just as importantly, to put in place measures to help them to transit to the new normal or the new equilibrium. So thank you very much. Thank you. Can I now invite, uh, thank you. Can I now invite uh, Minister uh, Desmond Lee to, uh, to talk about uh, preschool services? Chan uh, just described, Good evening. Uh, as the circuit breaker comes to an end, uh, workplaces will reopen, uh, parents will need childcare support, and younger children uh, will need to continue with their learning and development. Uh, to support parents who would like care arrangements for their children, uh, preschools as well as early intervention centres will start to resume general services uh, from the 2nd of June uh, 2020. Uh, they will reopen in phases with an emphasis on safety and minimising the risk of transmission. So this is the phasing. Uh, our preschools, the children can return by cohorts. Uh, on 2nd June, K1 and K2 children can return. Uh, a week later, on the 8th of June, uh, Nursery 1 and Nursery 2 children can return. And from the 10th of June, infant care and playgroup children can return. So that, that is for preschool. Our early intervention centres will also reopen in phases, starting with in-person intervention for children with higher needs and children who only attend early intervention centres. Uh, to reduce the risk of transmission uh, between centres, children who attend preschool uh, will continue to receive their early intervention services remotely. We will work with our service providers to safely and gradually resume early intervention services for these children with priority for K2 children. And we'll provide more updates on the resumption of early intervention services for these children at a later stage. Supplementary programs such as enrichment and early intervention services where providers may move across different centres uh, will remain suspended for now because if you have uh, providers who go to one centre and another and another, there's always a risk of uh, transmission across uh, multiple settings. Now, so I've talked about preschools and early intervention centres. The third category would be student care centres. For older children, student care centres will fully reopen uh, on the 2nd of June with necessary precautions in place 
within the centre. Now, let me explain why we're taking a, a phased approach uh, for uh, preschool and early intervention. Uh, we want to do so because we want to give time for our staff, children and parents to adhere to enhanced safe management measures and to ease the transition on our young children. Uh, while we cannot eliminate the risk of uh, transmission of virus in these settings, we can minimise the risks. And therefore, rules and practices in preschools and early intervention centres will have to change, and strict adherence to these requirements will be needed. Now, since uh, late January this year, we have been tightening the precautionary measures for preschools and early intervention centres. And with preschools reopening, these measures remain and will be enhanced. And we call these measures uh, COVID-safe ABCs, so the ABCs of uh, keeping safe. Safe access, safe behaviour, and safe classrooms. Access, behaviour, and classrooms. So access focuses around the measures needed uh, to ensure that as far as we can, people who enter the preschools are safe. That means uh, not exhibiting symptoms, uh, not of high risk. Uh, behaviour in the sense of the kinds of behaviours that uh, preschoolers, teachers, staff and parents need to uh, carry out on a day-to-day -day basis, both at home and in the preschool setting, uh, in order to keep each other safe. And classrooms, uh, from the point of view of uh, trying to cohort uh, the children, uh, keeping uh, classes from intermingling with each other in order to contain within the preschools uh, any risk of transmission across multiple classes. Now, let me start with uh, COVID safe A, access. Uh, some of our key precautionary measures include restricting entry of visitors, as well as people who face a higher risk of infection. Uh, these would include those who are family members, those whose family members are on stay home notice or home quarantine. We would ensure uh, that the strict temperature and health checks for all staff and children multiple times a day. And this is not just a requirement that we impose, but these have to be carried out uh, as a process frequently throughout the day. So it has to be carried out as a process. Those who are unwell will not be allowed to enter the centre and they should see a doctor immediately. Uh, we need to do this because you know, some, some parents may feel that, well, the child may have a bit of sniffles, mild symptoms, it's okay to send the child to the preschool. Uh, and of course, there are some preschool staff who feel that they have a responsibility to carry on their duties because uh, they, they uh, don't want to uh, stay away and then let the burden fall on the rest of their colleagues. But as you know, the uh, nature of the virus is such that uh, even with mild symptoms, the risk of infection and transmission remains. And therefore, the mindset on access to preschools uh, will have to take that into account. Uh, so we seek the understanding of uh, parents, uh, of teachers, uh, that uh, taking care of their own health and making sure that if they're not well, they stay away from preschools, ensures that the rest of the preschool community uh, stays safe. And we seek the understanding of support of employers to exercise flexibility to their staff uh, who have young children uh, and who may have to handle some of the caregiving uh, responsibilities if their children are not feeling well and cannot go to a community setting uh, like a preschool. And this will happen more frequently under the new norm, and it's a case of parents as well as employers and the community uh, pitching in uh, during this time. So that's COVID-safe access. COVID-safe behaviour is about instilling uh, culture, habits, practices and norms among uh, preschool staff, among the preschool children, as well as parents of preschoolers, all having to instill that uh, culture uh, in order to re reduce the risk of transmission. So frequent hand washing, uh, taking care of each other. Uh, in addition, children aged two or older will have to wear a mask or a shield when in the center. In fact, during the uh, uh, circuit breaker period with limited service, that means for children of healthcare workers or essential service workers who are uh, not able to work from home. Already the children in the preschools today uh, have been wearing masks. They are above uh, age two and above. And so far, most of the children have uh, been able to adapt uh, to wearing those masks. Uh, but uh, 
Under the Stay Prepared Initiative, uh, Tamasic Foundation is providing face shields to all 180,000 uh, preschool and uh, preschool children, uh, as well as early intervention children, uh, and some 30,000 staff, in addition to other supplies like hand sanitizers. And at a, at a, in the next few days, we'll, we'll show you what some of these face shields look like. So it's a hat uh, with a shield, and uh, it will be uh, easier on the children, and certainly for the staff as well, easier for them to communicate uh, and care for the children. Uh, Ramatex, in partnership with ASTAR, had also donated some 19,000 masks, uh, disposable children's masks, uh, to our preschool and early intervention centres. And we are grateful for their support to ensure that our preschool and early intervention com community stay safe. Now, the third phase of the ABC is C, classrooms, COVID-safe classrooms. And we want to aim to reduce physical interaction and cross-contamination between different classes and cohorts of children as much as possible, even though you know that in a preschool setting, a space is always, you know, uh, either void deck or a centre, and uh, they will need to do some reconfiguration. And so what we'll do will be to stagger, drop off and pick up times to allow for safe distancing as parents bring the children uh, to the preschool. We will stagger the use of common areas and facilities so that uh, different classes use the spaces at different times and they are cleaned in between. There will be suspension of activities that involve more than one class or cohort. Uh, and, of course, safe classrooms also depend on safe uh, staff interactions between teachers and among teachers. So staff meetings should be conducted virtually as far as possible, uh, but if, if they need to do so, uh, apart from using uh, video conferencing technology, uh, they should exercise safe distancing measures. Uh, we ask that uh, our, our preschool community of, of staff and children and parents not see this merely as rules and regulations. Uh, these measures are essential to safeguard the health and well-being of all uh, within the centres and adherence is absolute necessity. So everyone has a part to play, uh, staff, children, as well as parents, and we must cultivate these safe habits such that they become second nature uh, to all of us. And only then can we ensure that the measures are as effective as can be. Uh, so we hope that the phased reopening of preschools and early intervention centres will provide time for staff, children, and parents to familiarise themselves uh, with the changes to daily routine. And to help instill these ABCs into the daily routine and habits of all in the community, EGDA will work with all our operators uh, to develop programs and activities. And therefore, for the first two weeks from 2nd of June, these programs and activities will be prioritised over norm normal curriculum. So for the first two weeks in all our centres, uh, there will be a concerted effort across all uh, preschools uh, to, to instill and familiarise and drill over and over again the, the habits and the culture that's necessary uh, from bringing a child to the centre safely to what goes on in the centre to the children's responsibilities to them leaving and going home and then what happens in the home as well. And this will go towards reinforcing a COVID-safe culture uh, amongst our preschool staff and to help children and parents adapt to these measures. We also ask parents to to continue to reinforce these habits and this culture and mindset at home to keep their children safe, not only at home, but when they go to the preschool as well. But this will bring some inconvenience, but this has to be the new norm. You know that young children tend to touch lots of surfaces. Uh, they're, they're younger and, it, uh, and using a, a fun way to, to inculcate the reasons for why we have to do this will be very important for them to understand uh, th that these habits are important for them. So we're taking a calibrated approach so that our preschools and early intervention community remain safe and that parents can get childcare support while being assured that the centres will do their best to keep the children safe and that children can con continue to learn because at the early age, developmental uh, interventions and uh, developmental pathways are extremely important for preschool children. And I seek parents' understanding as we gradually resume full services. As the community and workplace interactions resume, uh, there may be an increase in, in community transmission and we must stay vigilant. Uh, we, we may expect that there will be cases uh, also affecting preschools, but then we have to quickly contain and, 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 and manage when this happens. 
but maintaining that vigilance requires everyone, parents, preschoolers, teachers, uh, to play a part. I would like to thank uh, our preschool teachers, our operators, our early intervention staff, who have been preparing the centres in anticipation of the resumption of services. Uh, all of you have worked tirelessly through the circuit breaker to prepare resources and materials for the young children, and many of you have also provided limited uh, services uh, to parents who need uh, childcare services. Uh, some of you have gone beyond the call of duty to uh, hand sew reusable masks uh, for the children in your centres, and this really is a, a wonderful reflection of the professionalism, but also the spirit and the care of our early childhood and early intervention centre. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite the Minister Hong Kang to share his plans for schools. Good evening, everyone. As we exit the circuit breaker and start to embark on the process uh, of roadmap to regain our normal lives, reclaim our future, the school system will likewise, as we exit the circuit breaker, work towards a road, work, embark on the roadmap to fully open school. But we cannot do so in one step. Huh? So there will also be a roadmap. So today, let me go through in this roadmap what are our key considerations and secondly, what are some of the specific measures. Key consideration one. Cannot open with a big bang, so who do we prioritise to return first? Uh, first of all, we need to support parents, just as Minister Desmond has mentioned, parents who need to work, essential workers, parents whose children need a high level of care, and therefore you see preschools are open almost over a few days, and therefore I think one priority group we want to open from 2nd June are the special education schools, because I think the parents need the support. Second priority group are the graduating cohort. They are taking their examinations this year. I know we've been trying to dial down the overemphasis on examinations, but I know these students and their parents are getting a lot more anxious. We want these students to come back on a daily basis to support them, because national examinations is coming. That's consideration one. Number two, second consideration, other than these priority groups, who else to return? Eventually, as we complete the roadmap, all should return. But I think as a start, it will be better we thin out the population in the school for the first few weeks for better safe distancing. So not all children should come back at the same time. I think many countries are currently opening their schools. They are all taking the similar approach, not a big bang, but thin out the school population. So what we have decided is called what we call a WIRO scheme, a weekly rotation scheme. So that will apply to primary and secondary school. It's a simple formula. So today's school open, say it's a primary school, P6s is a graduating cohort, so they keep coming back every day. The rest, P1 to P5, so P1, 2, 3, for example, or rather P4 and 5, you come to school this week. P1, 2, 3 was do home-based learning. Next week, you switch around, and then you keep rotating. Secondary school, we can do a similar arrangement. Sec 4 and 5s are graduating cohort, come back every day, they need the support. So SEC 3s can come back for the whole week, SEC 1 and 2, do your home-based learning. Next week, swap around. And so we can continue that a few cycles. I, I let everybody know, in MOE, we really considered another model, which is called daily rotation, a DARO method, instead of WIRO, DARO method. Quite attractive in concept, because you can start off to say that you come to school two days, and you do home-based learning three days. A couple of weeks later, you come to school three days and then two days HBL. And then you come to school four days, one day home-based learning, and you gradually ease yourself in. Very attractive, but when we think about it, operationally almost impossible. Because every child will have a different schedule, and if you're a parent with a few children, you'll be totally confused. And I cannot imagine the bus driver uncle will be even more confusing. Every day he's picking up different children. 
And I think teachers will also tear their hair out because they tend to plan lessons on a weekly basis. So we really considered that. Quite a few parents suggested that to me, but I think we go with weekly rotation. It's simpler to, to remember. Uh, and I would have to say that a we row method, a weekly rotation method, I think getting feedback from parents also suits working demand, uh, working pattern more. Uh, better because quite a number of employers actually rotate their staff to work from home on a weekly basis. Yeah? So I think they will suit that reality better. Um, there will be parents where your kid is rotated to do home-based learning, but you really need to go to work now after 2nd June, contact the school. We are able to take in the child. The child will have a place to do his home-based learning with some supervision. We have always done that for essential workers and children from high needs, uh, with, with high, high needs, and we'll continue to do that and extend to the parents who need to work after 2nd of June and don't have alternate arrangements. Um, likewise, student care centres, K-Care will resume with fixed grouping, high standards of hygiene, as Desmond mentioned, similar. Now, let me move to junior colleges and millennial institute. These are the older students, 17 and 18 years old. We will not have a weekly rotation method. Instead, they will have more flexibility. Uh, junior colleges will essentially schedule students such that 50% will be back in school any, any day. Yeah? And each school will have their own flexibility, and they will communicate to their students and their parents. We will do this for two cycles, so four weeks. Yeah? Uh, rotation for two cycles. By then, I hope we will be able to move on to a new phase of opening and then after that have all students back in school. But we will watch and see. But minimally, we will hold this position, this posture for two cycles, four weeks. Let me now move on to IHL or Institutes of Higher Learning. They will also see a proportion of students returning to campus. ITE is now in session. Institute of Technical Education is in session from June. Uh, so they will also do a weekly rotation of students from different courses. So they will go online one week and then on campus lessons one week. And when on campus, that's when they do their lab work and their practical work. So at any one time, we expect 40% of students to be back in campus. Polytechnics uh, in session. Um, but many of them will have a two-week break, semester break in June. So I think uh, for these next few weeks, you will see a, quite a, uh, not many students coming back to the polytechnics. But after their semester break in June, when school reopens, you should also see about a quarter of students back in school at any given day, mostly also to do their practical work and attend lab lessons. The same for universities such as the Singapore Institute of Technology as well as SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design. Both are in session. They will take the same approach. The other universities, the autonomous universities, they are on vacation. So they, their school will open in August or September. Um, so likewise for all the IHLs, they will progressively, they will start off with a proportion of students back in school and progressively work on a roadmap to have more and more students come back to school for face-to-face -face lesson. Consideration number three, what other precautions will we take in schools? And I think we do need to take sufficient precautions and my hope is to be able to implement within our school entire education system a safe management framework that others can also refer to. And I think there are four aspects to a holistic safe management framework. It has to involve screening, hygiene, cohortization, and then safe distancing. Let me just briefly touch on each. Huh? One is screening, essential is health screening. If you are sick, don't come to work. We have been doing that in our schools at the gate. If a child has a fever or not feeling well, sore throat, cough, they don't come to school. We actually isolate them and get their parents to bring back. So it's not just temperature. We have always been screening for flu symptoms, uh, all flu symptoms for the children. We will go a step further now. Um, the reason is we have 29 student infections so far since the beginning of this epidemic. Two are from overseas, two are unlinked. 
and the rest are from adult members from their household. So we will take a step further to say that if a child comes to school, we will ask the child, do you have any adult members in your family with symptoms such as fever or cough? If there is, we will isolate the child, get the child to go home. When the family member recover, the child can come back. And I think that is really from, uh, from an abundance of precaution given the infection pattern of students so far. Um, number two, hygiene. So school will continue to go through daily cleaning and disinfection, especially the high touch areas like railings and door handles. Hand washing, wipe down, we've been doing that and we'll continue doing that. Um, just, a, just a fact, for a primary school ch child, they actually will be guided to wash their hands with soap four times a day. Once before school, before lessons start, twice before their breaks, and one because the recess, one of the recess involved eating, and after eating, they will wash up, wipe down, and also wash their hands. So four times. I do recommend that to everyone. If you wash your hands four, six times a day, not touch your face, your chances of infection really goes down. Number three, cohortization. This means forming bubbles around each class and minimal cross-mingling between the bubbles. Uh, so in line with that, CCAs, tuition, enrichment, center-based learning will continue to be suspended because all these bring together students from different class and in fact different schools together to mingle. So I think it has quite high risk. So as the first step of this roadmap, we will suspend all those activities, uh, except we have a dilemma which is there are students that attend center-based learning to prepare for their examinations. They are part of the graduation cohort. This could be mother tongue language centers lessons or centers that teach mother tongue languages or examinable subjects such as music and art. So we do have a dilemma. So after angsting about it, we decided for this group of graduating cohort, we will allow their center-based teaching to continue, but it will be done in small classes, 20 maximum, short periods, one and a half hours, and staggered timings. Fourth aspect of safe management is safe distancing. So in classroom, we will arrange exam style sitting with each child, uh, children about one meter apart. We will stagger recess, and then during recess, fix sitting in canteen, also with one meter apart at least. And then arrival and dismissal will, as far as possible, also be staggered. So if there are many schools or a few schools in one neighborhood, we may stagger their start time to deconflict the traffic. Uh, during dismissal, we can stagger by mode of transport. So if you are walking from home, you can go first. Then those taking school bus can go next. Those which taking private cars can go finally uh, go last and you spread out spread out the traffic. Um, and finally, mask. Uh, teachers, students will all wear masks, can be cloth, can be surgical, or can wear a face shield, like what Desmond mentioned. It will be an added layer of protection. Um, let me just end my comments uh, uh, by saying this. In the beginning of this year, when COVID-19 first emerged, I think many countries uh, closed their schools and for many, and they are now starting to open in phases. So for many of their students, the school year has hardly started, no? not until now, and that's opening in phases. And I increasingly, I think there's a lot of awareness, a lot of literature talking about the detrimental effect of students and children as a result of this closure in schools. And some go to the extent of saying it may even set them back for many years. Um, fortunately for us, we have managed to keep school safe and able to keep learning going uh, and school remain open until the 8th of April when we close schools uh, in line with our circuit breaker measures. And even so, we ensure that learning continue through home-based learning. And throughout this whole period, we managed to ensure that schools are safe and students are kept away from the virus. So this is really possible uh, because the teachers really did a wonderful job in managing the entire, uh, entire uh, school operations, ensuring that home-based learning can continue. And now with a new phase opening, uh, they also have to manage a new 
uh, situation. So they have been outstanding. So I just want to end my remarks by thanking all our teachers. And also parents and students for all your patience, all your understanding, and all your cooperation. Thank you. Your understanding and all your cooperation. Thank you. Thanks. I'll ask uh, my Director of Medical Services, uh, Kenneth, to give a quick update on the medical side before uh, Minister Lawrence Wong will do the wrap-up. Thank you very much, Minister. As of the 19th of May, 2020, 12 p.m., the Ministry of Health has uh, preliminarily confirmed an additional 451 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. The vast majority of these cases still remain work permit holders residing in foreign worker dormitories. There's only one Singapore resident among the cases uh, today. We're still working through the details uh, of the cases and further information will be provided in the MOH press release that comes out uh, later tonight. Uh, if we look at the previous cases that occurred up to yesterday, uh, we noticed that uh, the number of new cases in the community continue to decrease uh, over time. And this uh, gives us confidence in the measures that we're taking now uh, to come out of the circuit breaker uh, phase. But we remain vigilant and keep a close watch on how the situation progresses in, in, among the cases in Singapore. Thank you. Uh, good evening. You have heard a lot of information, so I will just give a very quick um, summary and wrap up. I want to start by first thanking all Singaporeans and residents of Singapore for working so hard over the past few weeks in helping us to bring the outbreak under control and significantly reduce our infection rates in the community. Uh, because of all our collective efforts, we are now ready to exit the circuit breaker and we can now start planning to resume activities uh, safely and in a phased manner. You have all heard the detailed plans for phase one from the respective ministers. Uh, we are starting phase one of the reopening in a very careful and calibrated manner. Many restrictions that are in place today will continue in phase one. I know uh, Singaporeans will be disappointed. Many have been hoping that with the um, end of the circuit breaker, they will be able to go out freely to socialize with their friends, to meet their families and relatives, and even dine together. Unfortunately, all of these activities will have to wait. And I hope everyone understands why this is necessary. Uh, we have to do this in a very careful and calibrated manner because we do not want to risk a flaring up of the virus again. And importantly, we do not want to sacrifice the efforts that all of us have put in over the past few weeks in controlling the outbreak. Uh, some businesses in Phase 1 will not be able to reopen. Uh, they include retail shops, personalised services, all of these are not planned for reopening in phase one. As you heard Minister Chan explain just now, uh, they can start preparing for phase two, but in phase one, because of the risk uh, that we have assessed, uh, they will still have to remain closed. Uh, the assurance we would like to give to all of them is that the government will continue to support these businesses and their workers uh, as they are unable to reopen um, from 2nd of June onwards. So the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance will be announcing more details on the measures that the government will provide next week in Parliament on the 26th of May. And as I said, our assurance is we will continue to provide support to these businesses that are unable to open. We can expect to be in Phase 1 for a few weeks uh, so we will need everyone to be patient and disciplined throughout this period of phase one. I can understand that you know, we have been in the circuit breaker for some time. People have been disciplined so far, but the feeling of being cooped up at home for a long period um, is starting to take its effect on people. And there is a very strong desire to go out, to socialize, to interact with your friends, but I hope 
we can all maintain our discipline for a while longer. As I said, phase one will take some time. We may have to continue with phase one for a few weeks uh, and continue with quite strict measures for quite a some time more. Because if we were to open up too quickly and allow all these social activities to restart, there is a risk that the virus will flare up and we might see many more cases and classes forming. So we do not want that to happen. We start in a controlled fashion in phase one. And if we are able to keep community transmission in a low and stable manner, maintain control over the virus situation both in the dormitories and in our community, then we will be in a position to enter phase two. Uh, so we call on everyone to do their part as we prepare for this new phase of reopening and as we enter phase one of the reopening process. Uh, stay disciplined, uphold personal and social responsibility so that we will be in a strong position to eventually enter phase two and have a broader range of activities resumed safely at that point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick summary. As we complete our circuit breaker period, we have evolved a three-phase roadmap to take us forward. Phase one is, to, uh, is aimed at allowing us to open carefully and cautiously and safely. This will take a few weeks for us to put in place these measures and to allow this opening to happen and to monitor the situation and to uh, may have to adjust some of the measures to ensure that we do not have a surge of cases. Then we enter into phase two, and phase two is a transition period. Then, and th this may comprise several steps. It's not a single step. It may re uh, involve several steps of measures to be put in place. And some of the uh, uh, restrict restriction measures may be rolled back over a period of time. It may involve months. It may take several months before we are able to complete phase two. And at the end of phase two, we will then arrive at phase three, which is that uh, we will have a safe Singapore, a safe nation. So phase one is a safe opening, phase two is a safe transition period, and phase three is a safe Singapore outcome. So I think this is the three phases of our roadmap going forward beyond the circuit breaker period uh, starting from uh, 2nd June. Now, questions from the floor. Thank you, panellists. Before we begin with the question and answer session, members of the media, we would like to ask you to refer to the latest set of embargoed press releases that has been emailed to you for your reporting purposes. Members of the media, as we begin the question and answer session, please remember to use the raise hand button if you would like to ask a question. Please note that, we, that you should only ask one question to allow for more to participate in this question and answer session. May we have the first question from Timothy from The Straits Times. Hi, thank you, Ministers, GMS. Uh, could you please elaborate further on the specific criteria, for instance, specific case numbers for moving from one phase to another, the timeline for the various community safe distancing measures that will be relaxed during the various phases, and whether this is a further easing of the circuit breaker or an exit from it? Thank you. I think as we uh, enter into phase one uh, of the uh, uh, post-circuit breaker measures, uh, we have now already looked at the number of cases and uh, uh, control measures that we have already put in place in the community. And we also, beyond just the numbers, we also look at the nature of the transmission. And if you look, up, look back at a few cases that we have seen uh, previously uh, in the last uh, uh, week or so, last couple of weeks, you find that most of the cases uh, happen within the household, which is to be expected because now uh, there are very limited social activities. And there are a number of cases that happen in the workplaces because there are still essential services going on. And there are a number of cases that are associated with the healthcare institutions because we, uh, we have uh, uh, healthcare services that continue and provide care for the infected patients. So these are the cases of transmission that we can see. Uh, even with the unlinked cases, there were also uh, a situation where there was associated with the family members and uh, workplaces. So therefore, we have a sense that uh, the generally transmission in the community has been managed, has been uh, controlled 
with the circuit breaker measure. So going forward, as we roll back some of the circuit breaker measures and enter into phase one of the roadmap, we will continue to monitor not only the numbers, but also the nature of the transmission, of the cases. If there are many cases popping up, if there's a surge in a number of cases, and if there are big clusters happening, then we may need to reintroduce some of the measures in a targeted way, depending on which particular sector has a higher risk profile. So uh, this way, we will then need to adjust our uh, measures during phase one. And if all goes well, if the number of cases remain low, we do expect the number of cases to go up somewhat because we are now opening, have more activities, have more interaction uh, uh, among people. So you do expect cases to go up. But if the cases can be managed and remain low over a sustained period of time, if we can see that the uh, cases are uh, continue to be linked and continue to have a good handle of uh, how the transmission happens and we are able to control it and we do not have major clusters happening during the uh, first phase, then we can consider moving on to the second phase. So it's not just a single uh, number, but we need to take into account a multiple, uh, a whole basket of uh, factors. And many of these factors are basically a risk assessment. It is not, uh, yes and no, it's not a, uh, a table that you tick off and then we say that, oh, we are past all these ticks and therefore we can move into phase two. So it, is, it requires assessment and uh, the multi-ministry task force with the help of professionals will make the adju that judgment as time goes on to decide whether or not we are ready to move into phase two. Uh, maybe uh, DMS would like to add on. Yes, we will be looking at this uh, very closely. Certainly as we release uh, uh, people to go back to work and uh, restart some of these services, uh, there may be an increased risk of spread of uh, COVID-19 in the community. And it's therefore important to make sure that this doesn't increase, that we continue to hold the line and continue to be confident uh, that uh, we have the safe distancing and, and uh, measures uh, in place uh, as these uh, businesses and these services uh, uh, resume. So we're looking very closely then at the number of community cases that we have, both linked and unlinked. We will examine very closely whether we can identify chains of transmission and, and, and be able to have a better understanding of how infection is spreading. And we will look very closely for any evidence to suggest that clusters are emerging. And we want to be vigilant. We want to be able to stem that quickly. And the success of being able to stop clusters forming will be part of our assessment as to whether or not we can move from phase one into phase two. Yes, and uh, to add on, we also uh, continue with our surveillance program. If we are able if, to pick up uh, more cases uh, during phase one, then we have to be more careful. And if the number of cases we pick up remain low, and then we will have more confidence to uh, open up. At the same time, as we mentioned earlier, we need to continue to step up our efforts in contact tracing, in our testing, to make sure that we are able to uh, manage the cases to prevent in a uh, search of uh, uh, new cases or a big cluster forming. Thank you, panelists. Can we have the next question from Sun Kiet from Zhaopao? Good evening, Mrs. and DMS. I'm Sun Kiet from Zhaopao. Just want to find out if how severe does an outbreak have to be at the workplace before the orders to shut the workplace down takes place after 2nd June, and whether there's any preschool educator or staff being tested positive so far. Maybe uh, Ikan can, uh, uh, Chan Chun Seng can talk about the uh, 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 companies, businesses, and uh, maybe uh, um, Desmond, uh, Minister Desmond Lee can talk about the preschools testing. The measures that we need to adopt to so for contain, companies, isolate, and track the cases have not changed and will not change. Today, if there's an outbreak of any one case detected at a company, we will start immediate contact tracing to isolate that unit to see whether there's a further spread. So that will not change after the 2nd of June and we will continue the same processes. So that's why it is very important for the management to work closely with the workers to make sure that they have a safe cohort plan so that in the event that something happens, they know who that uh, infected worker has come into contact with and then we can limit the, uh, we can contain the situation within that unit. Uh, but if the company do not take active management steps to cohort their workers, and if there's too much social interactions, then we will unfortunately have no choice but to widen the 
number of workers that have to stop work at any point in time. That's why that system of tracking who have interacted with who in which shift is so important. Can I, can I address the question on preschools? Uh, as uh, you would know, we started the uh, one-time testing of all preschool and early intervention uh, staff. Uh, and of seven, as of 17th of May, some 8,500 preschool and early intervention staff have been swapped uh, and will be tested. Uh, as of now, we've not got any confirmed positive cases, but uh, given that we're going to test some 30,000 uh, staff, uh, we do expect that, that there might be some cases. There might be some cases. Thank you, Minister. Here is the next question. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Cheryl from CNA? Hi, good evening. Um, I would just like to ask a bit more about the guidance for visiting senior parents. Uh, what is the frequency that this would be allowed? And also, how is public transport going to cope with safe distancing, given that more people are going back to work and school? Thanks. Thank you. I'll talk about the senior visiting, and then uh, Minister Lawrence Wong can talk about the public transport. Uh, the rules really is to focus on protecting the seniors. And so we try to do uh, to allow the children to visit their seniors, uh, but with a certain restriction. First, uh, we will allow children to visit their parents or grandparents uh, once a day, each one household per day. This is to minimize the number of people going to the ho senior households. So one household will be allowed to visit their parents a day and a limit to two person per visit because we also do not want to have a big family, a big household gathering at the seniors' place because this will create crowds and will minimize the safe distancing possibility. So we want to ensure that even at the seniors' home, you are able to practice safe distancing, provide sufficient space for the seniors, and seniors themselves may have their own household members. So we restrict to one household visit per day, and each visit limit to two person. Some may ask, what if I have uh, many members in my household, so how do I do it? So our suggestion is you can do it over a period of days. Each day, two person can visit the seniors. And it is uh, both the parents as well as parents-in-law. So you can visit your parents as well as your parents-in-law, but subject to one visit a day, and each visit two person. And I should also uh, uh, reiterate that we will not allow the seniors to visit uh, their children because we want the seniors to stay at home as much as possible. So you should not leave your home and visit your children and hop from household to household. This will uh, increase exposure unnecessarily to the risk of infection. So we encourage seniors to stay at home. Your children and your grandchildren come and, can come and visit you, but one household per day, two person a visit. I know this is very restrictive and there will be a lot of appeals and a lot of uh, uh, angst among the uh, ch uh, children because everybody wants to see your parents and to visit your grandparents all at the same time. Uh, but we hope that you can understand the purpose of these rules is to protect the seniors. Because you have many people come to the household, many households come to the seniors, uh, the parents' place, you are end up going to end up with a party. So we want to avoid having this uh, gathering of a people in the seniors' house. So we encourage you to visit one a day uh, and each visit two person. Um, on public transport, there are a few things that we will do. First, the public transport operators will ramp up their capacity in order to meet the increase in demand as more people commute to work or school. Uh, number two, we will require businesses to stagger working hours so that we can minimize travel during the peak periods. But thirdly, um, I, despite doing all of these measures, ramping up capacity, having staggered hours, uh, we fully expect that it will be difficult to maintain physical distancing in public transport, trains or buses uh, in, during the peak periods. Maybe not for the entire route, but in certain journeys, for certain bus routes or MRT routes, it will be difficult to maintain physical distancing. So we will focus on other safe management measures uh, for public transport, and that will include wearing of masks 
and re requiring commuters not to speak to one another or to speak um, with, uh, on the phone so that they can they avoid spreading droplets while they are in an enclosed space and we can keep public transport safe during this period. At, at the same time, the public transport operators are committed to step up their cleaning of the public transport as well in order to ensure the services are safe. So these are all the efforts we will put in place uh, as we have more people commuting to work, going to school, we will ensure that public transport remains a safe mode of travel. Thank you. I should uh, clarify that for the seniors' visits, uh, we will make exceptions for seniors who do not have their own children and they may need to have their uh, uh, si other siblings or other uh, nieces and nephews to visit them. We will make exceptions on an appeal basis for seniors who do not have their own children. So that will cater to the needs of the seniors who may not have uh, any children. And I also should uh, emphasize that we still do not allow uh, families, siblings to visit one another. So this rule allows you to visit your parents, your grandparents, as well as your in, in, parent-in-law and grandparents-in-law, but siblings are not allowed to visit one another because we do not want to have a cross-household infection and when you visit your uh, grandparents or parents, then the risk of infection will increase. So avoid visiting one another. If need be, visit your parents and your grandparents, including your in-laws. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Arana from Reuters? Kindly keep your question to just one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I was just wondering if everything goes according to plan and we keep the number of cases low and clusters, large clusters don't form. Do, we, do you have a sort of an estimate of how long each you expect each phase to last? Basically, when is a reasonable time that we could reach phase three of the new normal? <laughs> this is a very... Uh... Difficult question because we, are, uh, we, I, we don't have a crystal ball to see what's going to happen. Uh, but generally, uh, uh, the measures that we put in place or even as we roll back the circuit breaker measures, we will need to, um, by and large, observe two periods of uh, incubation. Each period of incubation is 14 days, so minimally we will have to look at 28 days before we think about uh, additional uh, relaxation or moving into phase two. So I think for phase one, we will be looking at at least four weeks, maybe uh, two weeks, because we may need to do some refinement, some adjustment along the way. So we are looking at perhaps uh, four to six weeks, depending on how the situation evolves, maybe longer. So I need to uh, manage your expectation. But minimally, I think we are not likely to make major shifts within the first uh, four weeks, because we do need uh, two incubation period to assess the impact of uh, what we have uh, introduced under uh, phase one before we con contemplate phase two. And phase two, as I mentioned earlier, is a transition phase. It may involve uh, multiple steps. We may relax some uh, measures earlier and some measures may have to continue for a longer time. So the period is uh, less certain, but it will involve uh, months. It, it will not uh, be just weeks. It may take three months, six months, depends. It may take longer depending on uh, how uh, uh, the situation evolves. And at the end of <clears throat> phase two, we will naturally arrive at phase three, which is a steady state, uh, uh, sustainable situation where we are able to make Singapore safe and there will be some measures continuing to be in place. And that will be actually for quite some time for a long term until perhaps uh, vaccines is available or we are able to find a cure and the disease no longer is uh, threatening. So that is a sustainable long-term situation, and that's phase three. So phase two uh, will take months. Phase one will take weeks, uh, minimally four weeks or maybe longer. And phase three, we are looking at a longer-term uh, sustainable. Uh, therefore, it doesn't have a time limit for phase three. Uh, can I just do a quick um, just a additional points, which is that when you think about phase two, and Minister Gan just explained that it will be done in stages. So obviously, after a few weeks of phase one, and when we have assessed that we are ready to enter phase two, we will start with the lower risk activities. So to give some sense of what we are looking at in the roadmap ahead, the earlier part of phase two, we will consider 
things like allowing some limited social activities, people to gather in small groups, dining in. So when we say small groups, meaning to say there will be controls on the number of people who can be together at any point in time. And then dining in may be considered, retail shops may open, um, sports facilities may open. So these are things that we, we think would be considered in the earlier part of phase two. Obviously, there are many other um, higher risk activities that you can, consider, you can think about, um, events, entertainment, attractions. Uh, these tend to have more crowds, more close contact with others, and these would naturally be assessed at the later part of phase two. Right? So we envisage phase two being done in multiple steps, and um, according to the risk, we will assess and we will proceed on that basis. Entering phase three then brings us to what we call a new normal. Phase three is not a return to life before COVID-19. In phase three, we envisage that many of the things that we are used to can continue, but there will be new controls, safeguards and limits. Right? Whether it's going to a theater, whether it's um, going to a cinema, whether it's going to a place of worship, we do envisage in phase three that these activities will be in place but there will be limits in, on the number of, on, on the group sizes. There will be safe distancing measures still in place. And so as a baseline through these phases, we do expect many baseline precautions to remain, whether it's basic personal hygiene, safe distancing measures, or wearing of masks. These are baseline precautions that we will continue throughout the phases. Thank you, Ministers. Can okay, we have the next question from Philip from Bloomberg? Hi. Um, I'm sorry to have to ask this, but uh, Minister Gan, you were at the, uh, at the World Health Assembly yesterday uh, and spoke of uh, cooperation with one another as we fight the pandemic. Uh, perhaps you've seen that uh, U.S. President Trump had then moved to um, threaten perhaps withdrawing uh, this kind of uh, funding for WHO. I wonder what you, if there's a reaction to that as somebody who spoke at the WHA. I think each country will have its own uh, considerations and they will have to act uh, in, uh, to protect their own uh, uh, population's uh, interests. And from Singapore's point of view, I think uh, to fight the COVID-19, it is important for us to continue to collaborate internationally because it is not possible to uh, get rid of COVID-19 for as long as there is a pocket of uh, infection somewhere else in the world. So it is important for us to continue to explore uh, opportunities to collaborate, to work together, and we respect each country's uh, position. But at the same time, we must continue to find ways to work together, whether it is in uh, sharing our experiences in uh, fighting uh, this uh, uh, pandemic or whether sharing knowledge in research and studies, um, better understanding of the virus and to look for vaccines as well as look for cure. I think these are efforts that no single country can succeed on its own. It is important for us to come together and uh, we may have to continue to explore uh, platforms and opportunities for us to be able to do so. Uh, not only at the WHO at the global level, but also at the regional level, working with our um, uh, neighbouring countries, working with our partners, both at the government level as well as at the private and, in, and uh, individual level. So I think in even companies to companies, we also want to con continue to encourage companies to collaborate and to uh, help us to come together to address this uh, global challenge that we are facing together. Thank you, Minister. Can we have the next question from polling from Channel 8 News? Hi, Minister. Uh, I have a follow-up with regard to the seniors' visit. Uh, would you be able to tell us how are you going to enforce the once a day and limit to two-person household visit? And also maybe you can share with us a bit about the places of worship that will be reopening after... Thank you, Pauline. Sorry, we have to leave it there. Minister, please. Uh, let me just focus on the seniors. Uh, I must uh, say that it is not easy for us to enforce and these rules are not rules and regulations to try to catch you. These rules and regulations are really there to protect the seniors. 
and we hope that the seniors will abide by these rules and the family members of these seniors to please abide by these rules so as to protect your own parents and grandparents. So instead of uh, focusing on how we can penalize you and find you or jail you, I think better to focus on the purpose and the spirit of these rules and regulations, and that is to protect the seniors in your family, in your household. So I think that's the spirit on, under which these rules are ro rolled out. But if we do come across uh, incidents where you have a big party gathering in your uh, uh, parents' house and there will be uh, feedback or complaints from neighbours and so on, and we will have to take action to prevent the spread of this uh, virus and which will endanger uh, everybody else. So we really want to urge each and every one of you to abide by the spirit of these rules rather than to just follow the letter of the law. Um, on places of worship, we are currently during the circuit breaker, all places of worship are closed. So from 2nd of June, this first phase of reopening, we are opening the places of worship for all faiths, but the requirement is that they are opened only for private uh, worship, private devotions or private prayers, meaning how members from the same household can go to the places of worship subject to a limit of five people from the same household at, a, at any time. And they can go there for their private worship or devotion. So the religious leaders across all faiths have are being briefed on these requirements and they will help to manage the situation in the different settings and ensure that safe distancing, safe management practices are put in place uh, as we allow this initial opening during phase one. And then, of course, subsequent after this in phase two, we can allow uh, beyond this uh, other, uh, you know, bigger groups together as we progress through the phases. But for now, phase one, it's only for private worship. No sure. congregational services will be permitted. Thank you, ministers. Can we have the next question from Stefania from the Financial Times? Hi, good evening. Um, I wanted to ask about the testing strategy as we move out of the circuit breaker and into phase one. Uh, and essentially, if it remains unchanged, meaning a sort of uh, the pivot to mass testing, the uh, goal of testing uh, uh, or having um, going through 40,000 tests per day, um, does that remain unchanged? And if it uh, remains unchanged, do we have uh, an update on when, or is there a timeline as to when we uh, will be able to carry out 40,000 uh, tests a day, or is Singapore uh, still facing a potential shortage on uh, uh, test kits, uh, and is the manufacturing of these test kits uh, still uh, a challenge? I think our testing strategy will have to evolve uh, according to our plans of uh, uh, this uh, roadmap of a reopening. And uh, we have been adjusting our testing strategy uh, as we go along, as you have observed. We have, uh, in order to prepare for the opening of the preschools, we have uh, devoted uh, the resources to test our preschool uh, teachers. And in uh, order for us to open up the economy, we have also uh, allocated resources of testing to test our workers who are going back to work. And all these will evolve as, the, as we roll out the plans, the roadmap for the reopening, uh, the phase one, phase two, and phase three. So uh, the testing strategy will adjust uh, uh, as we go along. And we are in the process of uh, also ramping up our testing cap uh, capacity. It's not just the test kit, as I uh, explained before. Test kits is uh, one resource which is very critical and very important for us, and we should focus and be quite strategic and targeted in our testing uh, approach. But test kits is just one of them. At the same time, we also look at the uh, manpower requirement uh, in terms of the number of swabbers that we need to recruit in order for them to be able to carry out the swabs uh, to, for the test to be done. At the same time, we also need to look at uh, laboratory uh, capacity. Having done the swab, taken the sample, you have the test kit done. But at the same time, we still need to process the test kit so that we can have the results of these tests. So I think the entire uh, supply chain uh, process 
chain for the testing uh, is involved. So we need to ensure that the capacity is in place, and this capacity will always uh, be uh, th there's a limit to uh, always a limit to this uh, capacity and these resources, and therefore we always have to uh, adjust our allocation of these testing resources to make sure that they are uh, most optimally uh, utilized. And at the same time, we are also exploring different types of uh, testing. We have PCR testing and we are also looking at uh, serology testing and to allow us to have different objectives of testing and to achieve different objectives and different purposes, serve different purposes. I've explained that during the last uh, press conference uh, the, uh, three different purposes of uh, testing. I won't go into the details. But I think those three purposes remain important, uh, but we will need to adjust the uh, weightage of uh, allocation for the three purposes as we move forward and as we un unfold the plans for our Opening, so I think uh, we will need to continue to adjust. Uh, DMS want to add on? Yes, uh, we yes. continue to uh, expand our test capacity, as uh, as has mentioned uh, before. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also looking at uh, new methodologies to maximize uh, the benefit we have from the tests that we uh, perform, and that includes uh, pool testing uh, methodologies particularly in settings where the risk of uh, spread uh, remains low. And that's why we think we can also maximize the, the diagnostic uh, yield uh, from these tests. Um, this, uh, in particular, would be a strategy that would be most amenable when it comes to surveillance uh, for um, selected uh, populations uh, of uh, people that we are particularly concerned about. Uh, to date, uh, we've done uh, more than uh, 281,000 tests uh, in the country uh, on more than 191 uh, thousand unique individuals. So that comes out something in the order of, uh, uh, of over 49,000 uh, tests per million uh, being done uh, in the country. So we continue to uh, uh, expand our test capacity and we remain committed towards performing the tests needed for the various strategies that we put in place to return people back to work, to return people back into the community yet safely uh, to make sure that the, the risk of spread remains under control. Uh, just a very quick point to add. Uh, we've explained how our testing capacity has been ramped up over quite a short time. Just not too long ago, we were testing at you know, 2,000 plus tests a day. Today, we are doing 8,000 a day. And we've explained that we are ramping up to 40,000 a day. And so our plans to ramp up that capacity, test kits, personnel, laboratories, all of these plans remain on track. These plans were not put in place you know, in a short time. They, they started months ago. And that's why we have been able to build up quickly from 2,000 plus tests a day to now 8,000 and we are on track to getting even further. We are today already testing at a rate that's amongst the highest in the world and we want to do even more beyond this. So that as we reopen the economy, as we resume activities, Testing capability and testing capacity will be a critical enabler for us to do all of these things safely. Thank you, panelists. Okay, we have the next question from Xiao Fang from Wan Bao. Hi, uh, my question is on DPN Heng's ministerial statement next week. What sort of assistance packages are we likely to see? And will the government provide further assistance to Dog operators, for example, offsetting certain costs or holding out PRW measures. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is please wait for DPM's uh, budget statement next week. Uh, but the, what I've said is that the, the principle that companies that remain closed um, because we are unable to allow them to open uh, at phase during phase one of this reopening, that we will continue then if they are closed in phase one to extend support to these businesses and their workers. Uh, so you have already see, seen the key items of the uh, measures that we have extended support to um, for businesses during the circuit breaker period. Uh, those items will remain for these businesses that are unable to open on in, in, the, in phase one of the reopening. Beyond that, of course, we will look at other items in the budget as the Ministry of Finance always does, but I will not be able to tell you what they are now. Please wait for the budget. Stay tuned. It's coming up in a week's time. This will be the fourth budget 
in the year. So it is really unprecedented and we are doing all we can to support businesses and workers. Thank you, Minister. We have time for the last two questions. Can we have the next question from Jane from Mothership? Hi, my question is for Minister Gan. Um, although it's the end of the circuit breaker, I understand that phase one can be seen more as a circuit breaker light, as we're still exercising a lot of caution in, in lifting the CB measures. So could I just check whether there's any analogy you'd like to use to explain how, to the public how life might not go back to normal on June 1st? Thank you. Sorry, Jane, can we get you to repeat your question? Thank you. Uh, so my question is for Minister Gan. Um, so we understand that phase one is going to be seen a bit more like a circuit breaker light since a lot of the measures in circuit breaker are still present. So is there an analogy that you would want to use to explain to the public how life might not go back, isn't going to go back to normal at, uh, on June 1st? Thank you. Well, uh, circuit breaker is uh, actually exactly like a circuit breaker. So if you have a circuit breaker at home, you know how to operate it. When something goes wrong in the electrical system, the circuit breaker will trip and you have to turn off the circuit breaker so that uh, to cut off the trip. At the same time, you turn off everything and you turn back on the circuit breaker and slowly, one by one, you turn on the switches and see which one trips again. And the, per the one that trips again is the one that is at fault. So that's the concept of circuit breaker. I'm an electrical engineer, so I can explain this. I try to explain this uh, in an engineering way. So in the same way, this circuit breaker, we apply it because there was an uh, outbreak, there was a pandemic. So we apply the circuit breaker to cut off almost everything. Uh, essential services continue, but we cut off almost everything so that we uh, 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 introduce a break into the transmission. So as we introduce a break into the uh, electrical supply in the house when there's a trip. So now that we are applying back, uh, turning on the circuit breaker again, or rather uh, uh, removing the circuit breaker again, that means we are turning on the power supply again. But at the same time, we cannot turn on all the switch at the same time. If you turn on all the switch at the same time, for sure it's going to trip again. So therefore, we have to be very careful, turn on one by one, slowly, gradually, and we, will see, we need to continue to observe and monitor as we turn them on. Because as we turn them on, if there's a trip again, then you know where the problem is. And similarly, as we uh, restore some of the services and activities and economic uh, 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 business activities, we also need to continue to observe to see which one particular activity is likely to create a problem. And if that is so, then we may need to introduce targeted measures to solve that problem. And therefore, going forward, as we roll out our phase one, phase two, and phase three uh, uh, roadmap, we need to continue to monitor. And life will not be as per normal before the COVID-19 outbreak. It will, uh, we hope to be able to restore to some level of normalcy. But at the same time, some of the uh, safe distancing measures, precautionary measures, will have to continue. Particularly, the protection of our seniors will have to be uh, uh, enforced because seniors are a particularly vulnerable group. If they are infected, the uh, outcome can be very se severe. And therefore, we need to pay particular attention to protecting uh, the seniors, even as we embark on this roadmap to uh, reopening of our economy and our society. So I think we hope that everyone will uh, uh, cooperate with us to support our plan and work together with us so that we can safely uh, remove uh, the circuit breaker, safely open our economy and society, and at the same time, a safe transition towards a safe nation. That's in our phase three. Thank you, Minister. We've come to the final question. Can we have Justin, can we have the question from Justin from today? Yeah, um, so the um, question is, um, there have been several cases of dormitory um, transmissions where um, they spread to uh, people in, in the community, right? So, um, so what precautions and social distancing measures apply for staff who work in the dorms but return back home to their families um, after the existing, um, that, that um, and also what precautions do staff, volunteers and officers take while in the dorms to avoid contracting COVID-19 themselves? And are these working? And if not, what more needs to be done? Yeah, it's a very good question and we are very mindful of the risk um, that our staff 
working in dormitories or in some of the care facilities are facing. And that's why we have highlighted this before, that we are now, we have been very mindful, we have taken precautions and we have continuously stepped up these precautions right, for the staff working in these environments to provide them with the necessary equipment, um, whether it's PPE, whether it's mask, and then to make sure that when they are working, they are very mindful of what they are doing. They take all the necessary precautions in terms of safe distancing. Um, they don't expose themselves unnecessarily. And then um, also, being, if, if there is any case that is detected, immediately doing the testing very quickly, doing an active sweep across all of the staff that are around that same area so that we are immediately able to detect a case should one emerge, including the close contacts of that worker, their family members, for example, so that immediately we can contain and ring fence any case that emerges. So this is indeed an area that we are watching over very, very closely, making sure that the precautions are tight, the safeguards are stringent, uh, and we want to give the assurance to the staff, to the volunteers who are working in these environments that we are doing everything we can to keep them safe and we are also stepping up training for them so that they are continuously reminded of the need of the precautions that they need to do. Um, the healthcare workers who are working in these environments uh, have, a, I think, a better training because of their background in healthcare. But not all of the people working in these settings come from a healthcare background. Right? You have security officers, you have dorm managers, you have uh, dorm operators. So we are constantly reaching out to them, engaging them, reminding them of the precautions, providing them with the equipment, and doing more tests on a regular basis as well in order to ensure that these are safe environments for the people who are doing very important and essential work there.